Hey, Ansible Fest. Thank you for joining us at our virtual experience this year. Um, we're here to talk to you about automating automating the edge. And um, I'm really excited to have you here. Thanks for joining our session. I know there's a lot of good stuff out there. So thanks for spending some time with us today. Um, I wanted to just jump into a, a picture I saw before we kick things off. Um, so it got me thinking the other day, you know, when I started in tech over 20 years ago, never thought or imagined that I'd be talking one day about pushing out you know, software updates to something like a fridge from a place as remote as Hawaii. Um, and yes, uh, Red Hat lets me live in Hawaii. It's, it's uh, pretty awesome I need to surf all the times, probably why this uh, picture speaks to me a little bit. Um, but again, it got me thinking about, you know, this day and age when we're, when we're architecting our new infrastructures, you know, we, we have these unexpected things in the future that we may not have not have thought of today, um, or even from locations that uh, you know, that weren't there years ago, or from locations that far. Um, but really, what we're here to talk to you today. My name is Brian Corson. I'm one of the principal product managers in the Ansible Business Unit. Um, you know, like I said, I've been in tech for for over 20 years at this point. Um, that's crazy to say for that long. Um, and I and I've loved it. I've seen a lot of stuff change over the years. Um, you know, I started as a you know network op operations. Uh, person, you know, sysadmin, gone up through the years. Uh, back in the day when you were, you know, physically located at a data center you worked at most likely, you know, you had your laptop, you could go walk out there and almost everything you had was was in the same data center. Um, then I remember the years, you know, back in San Diego where the data center got went across town. You know, I still could drive if I needed to, but, you know, it's like it's still the same town. Then, then later it wasn't even in the same state. Um, so over the years, you kind of, you know, seen these changes happen, and um, every time these changes go through, there's a new way that you have to to change how you're managing these devices at the other end, um, so you can touch all of them. And really, it's kind of how what got me started in all this. And uh, my co-presenter, Michelle. Thank you, Brian. Hey, everyone. My name is Michelle Knoll, and I'm on the Ansible product marketing team. And my areas of focus are all around edge and partners. And while I'm new to Red Hat, <clears throat> I joined a little bit earlier this year. Um, unfortunately, I do not work from Hawaii. A little bit jealous there. Um, but I'm not new to the world of Edge and IoT. I've spent the past six years um, during some of my time at SAS, um, really in this in the, the Edge and IoT world, um, focusing on the AI and, and analytics aspects from the Edge to the cloud. Um, during my 10 years at IBM, prior to that, I worked a lot in the hardware space um, all around the data center, servers, storage, networking. Um, so I love how it all comes together in this space. And we'll talk a little bit about all of those things in this session today. So I'm excited to be presenting here with Brian. So some of the things we'll talk about today and, and share with you, we'll go through some of the complexities of managing edge infrastructure. Um, we'll dig in a little bit to the, the Red Hat Ansible automation platform components uh, from an edge management perspective. Um, we will uh, talk about how we define the edge infrastructure locations, um, look at what's being done today, um, and just how you can um, automate at the edge and, and some current use cases that we're seeing. Let's um, start with uh, what is edge and how we define it. Um, so we define it really as bringing computing and, and storage and networking services closer to where the data is being generated um, and really enabling organizations to achieve things like better operational efficiency um, for new or existing workloads um, and really are all around implementing new opportunities to generate revenue. It's always about this new revenue streams. Um, and so in terms of edge computing, you know, Clearly, it's already here. Um, the concept of edge computing is not new. Um, and organizations across many industries are, are looking at ways that they can benefit from edge computing. It's really by bringing it all to, together with new application um, development approaches along with the, the cloud operational models. And so Brian is going to share with us um, some use cases in the verticals that you see here. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. So yeah, like we're saying, edge edge is not something that that's new. Um, it's been around um, for a while, and these are you know some of the challenges that these verticals have already been architecting for. You know, gives you an idea of what maybe we need to plan for in the future. So let's look at you know some telecommunications things. You know, these are you know these providers um, they see they're seeing a, a huge increase in devices that are very bandwidth hungry. We have all these cell phones out there, um, and and a lot of cell phones users demand, you know, a uh, very seamless experience, and 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 more of this is scaling out all the time. 
Um, so not only are they building out things for scale, they also have to do this at, uh, at the same time, lower costs um, and even bring in new revenue streams to what they're already building out. You know, so so for an example, some of the things that uh, some of the telecom industry is doing today is they're virtualizing their radio access networks, um, because when they virtualize these networks, you can bring them closer to the edge or easier to scale them out where they are, depending on, you know, how they built them in the first place. Um, but making these software based makes them easier to move around, but now and also build out when they need the scale on demand. Um, and this is also happening at the same time when 5G is rolling out. So, you know, they're building out these new features as, as well as uh, expanding all of the, the, the physical and software infrastructure that's already out there to bring these new, um, new capabilities to their customers. Um, and then, and some of the, the broader trends we've seen in other verticals, for example, in like ma manufacturing and energy sectors are things like AI powered intelligent applications. So they can actually, you know, in real time, uh, get uh, business analytic data from wherever they are in wherever they are placed so they can in real time figure out these things report back see what's happening um, at the at the actual sites right so in the manufacturing areas and the energy areas you might have these these units close to where the work is happening and you still need to to report back on those they're going to need to be updated and things like that so moving on with with what some of these verticals are um, architecting for comes with some new complexities, right? So when we're talking about this, now we're talking about a scale that hasn't always been there before. You know, it's, um, you can get into the hundreds of thousands of devices sometimes when you get down to the very far edge because there's just so many of them. Um, and sometimes they're very basic units, but they are still gonna need to be connected to, updated, and, and knows where they're gonna be at this point. They could be local, they might be far away. Um, and then also because of this massive scale we're talking that you can see and we're talking about is interoperability between all of them. You know, if you're talking about things at the numbers in the hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands, I really doubt we're going to have too many places where every single thing is the same. That would be great. But usually when you get to those kinds of numbers, you're going to have some different different types of devices you're going to be talking to. Um, so really some of the complexities is finding finding a, a tool a platform that can talk to all these things um, and handle them end to end for you. Um, and then coming back to the scale and inoperability is the consistency. You know, if you have a massive scale because of all these edge devices that might start um, coming into your, uh, into your infrastructure or that you may have to start managing and also the different types of them that you're gonna have to talk to is how, how are you gonna be able to, to be trained or keep your uh, training up to be able to talk to all these things and then, you know, even offset some of these workloads that you may have to other teams and things within your organization. You know, you want to have a consistent approach so it's fairly similar between all these different types of devices and everything that you're doing. And that brings us up to our next one where why why would automating these different different use cases and complexities, you know, why would you want it to automate all these things? Or how does automating these things help with the complexities of them? Well, so you have a lot of a lot of different use cases and, you know, and bringing these things from the for the, the things like mass configuration pushes out, right? So you're talking about a scale. Um, it could be similar to, to what we, we've been used to in the sysadmin world, you know, hundreds and thousands of servers is not uncommon. Um, but the, the mass configuration to push out, you're gonna need also a platform that can scale with that. And also with automation, you can, you know, configure once and then do it repeatedly over and over again. That kind of brings us down to things like the offsite updates and compliance, right? So not because of these mass configuration things that you push out, you might not always have people locally on site um, to do these updates, you know, and, and you could even have different compliance restrictions depending on where these devices are. I mean, if you're worldwide, you probably have a lot of geo uh, restrictions or laws that you're, you're, you have to contend with that could be different depending on where you are. Um, so it's definitely harder to have a consistent approach to that. Um, and then things like disaster recovery. You know, if you don't have somebody on site, you may need to be make sure these devices are up and managed properly to know when something is going wrong. You know, and then you can have an automated way to kick these things over to different uh, different workloads or where you need them when things happen. And then even future driven automation, like event driven automation. So now you might have all these sensors and all this data out there. What can you do with it? So, you know, you can take a, an event coming in and then do something 
for that. You know, maybe it's a break fix that you're pushing out. Maybe it's just an update um, or maybe you're waiting for some work to be done. I mean, there's a lot of uh, opportunity out there with the edge, especially because so much of the workload is done on the edge. Um, having this event driven automation, you know, when that workload is ready, you can have something you know, set up already ready to go for you. So now with with all these also is um, we wanted to kind of go into how we're defining the edge here at Red Hat. So with this, I wanted to pass it over to Michelle. Yeah, so we really, um, to define this, this edge deployment architecture, we've split it into three blocks essentially. So we have the data center, which is where your core uh, infrastructure is located. And then the distributed edge devices kick in once you leave the data center. And then the third um, block being the far edge, the endpoints or your devices that are either close to or at the edge. Um, and this is really where you start seeing the um, devices in the tens, the tens, to thousands, the tens to hundreds of thousands, um, talking about some of the scalability that, that Brian referenced earlier. Um, so now that we have looked um, at, the, at the architecture and how we define it, we, we wanted to take a look in, and dive into a few industries specifically. Um, obviously, edge um, use cases cover many verticals, but this edge pattern um, is often is very similar. And so um, Brian is going to take us through how this translates back to our, our edge definitions. Thanks, Michelle. And yeah, like she was saying, we see some consistent patterns with how we can interface with these things. And um, that's kind of how we came up with, uh, or part of the ways we came up with the definitions that we're looking at because we see these patterns fall into these um, different types of silos. So let's take financial services, for example. I mean, the, the, the biggest one that would be, you know, we can think of our banks, right? So you, you'll have, they have their major data centers, you know, those usually multiple, but you have your major data center where a lot of the processing happens, a lot of the things are stored. Um, and that is what we call data center. But then we have distributed edge and, you know, those are going to be your things like your branch locations, which aren't connected to the data. Well, they're connected, but they're not part of the data center, but you're still at all these branch locations gonna have your things like um, the local assets you need. So you're gonna have networks, um, network equipment, uh, servers possibly, you're probably gonna be having things for internet access like Wi-Fi. you may have door badge access, you know, there could be safes for things that need um, automatic locks. You're, you're gonna have things local there as well. Um, and then what could be far edge for financial services are gonna be things like ATMs. You know, those can still be at the branch locations, but you can also have an ATM removed from a branch location. So now you have these three sections that you need to automate, you know, push updates to and manage. Um, and, and with financial services, you can imagine security is very important. I mean, security is important for everybody, but you know, there's there's lots of controls and, and security features that financial services are specifically required to go by. Um, so the security is gonna be very important when they're pushing out these changes to make sure they know what's going on and uh, what, what they have to push out. Um, and then we get into some manufacturing use cases we've seen, you know, and again, you're gonna have your, your data center locations, you know, where your main processing is, your, your, your main server farm, could be in the cloud, you might have your own data center, but that's uh, the main, main hub, may even be at the manufacturing plant, manufacturing location. Then you'll have your thing like your distributed distributed edge there. So those are going to be your things like your factories, where things are actually built and done or whatever you're producing uh, for this type of manufacturing asset, right? Um, but just like previous and financial services, you're going to have local assets there that you're going to have to manage. You're going to have networks set up, most likely servers there. Um, you're probably even going to have, you know, again, Wi-Fi cameras, those kind of things, uh, door access, you know, that's all going to be at your distributed edge. But this far edge um, and endpoint location for something like manufacturing may not be as far, but it could be very numerous because you're probably going to be talking about um, control units and processors locally at the factory. And even though they might not be far, you could already in, in one building be talking thousands to tens of thousands, you know, in one, one location could be hundreds. Uh, but again, you're probably going to see a much larger scale than physical ATM locations, you know, in the same building um, when you're talking about a manufacturing plant. So this brings um, scaling there uh, that our customers are doing. Um, and then we also have the classic retail example, right? You know, you go to go to a retail store, a uh, clothing shop, grocery store, um, you know, there's going to be a data center somewhere that does all that. Again, it could be the public cloud, um, or sorry, cl cloud, or it could be their own data center. But then you'll have your, your store locations. And again, like the other ones, you're going to have your network and 
things local that need to be updated, but then you're also have things like point of sale systems. Um, and those may, and sometimes for different retail use cases, may need to be spun up and spun down. Say you need seasonal, you know, expansion to scale out at certain times of the year. It's going to be really important that it's um, very consistent between different stores, or at least within the same store. So when you're scaling these things up and down, it could be multiple times a year. Um, it's not different every single time. You know, you have a very consistent experience, which is also makes it easier to get um, your your organization trained up and, and stay trained to get these things pushed out like that. Um, but this is what we've been seeing out there today um, with what what our platform offers. Um, but going forward, we have some some new features and components coming out that we're really excited about. Um, and I really wanted to talk about Automation Mesh a little bit. Um, so what Automation Mesh is going to help you do is put some of this automation capacity localized to where you need it. So we're going to call those, uh, or we do call those execution environments now. So if you've gotten onto platform 2.0, you may have already started uh, playing with these. Um, so Automation Mesh is going to be coming out later this year. So if you are using any of these execution environments, they're living on the controller. Um, but in the future, we see where you can put this execution capacity localized um, and get to where you need to go much more easy. Um, let's take it. Let's take a a fun use case. Uh, say you're managing a satellite. Uh, you know, you only have a couple hours a day to talk to this um, talk to this asset when it when it goes over a certain certain point. But also, the only way to communicate with this place is a very is a remote location that you don't always have somebody staffed at 24/7. Um, so something like automation mix and it, automation mesh and execution environments, you can put something local to where you need it and have that consistent communication. Because even if that communication breaks, you can make sure the execution environment will kick off the automation that you have set it up to do. Um, so still same from your controller and the automation controller is still gonna operate in the same way. You can still kick off jobs directly from that. Um, and that can even go all the way to your edge if your infrastructure is architected to support that. But if not, You'll have mesh that can bring all these EEs together um, wherever you need them and get that out uh, re, um, much more consistently. And also, this, this goes back to the scaling issue. You know, If you have a lot of these things everywhere, your execution capacity can be where you need it for all the scaling. And really, this brings us back to, you know, with all these different diverse use cases, uh, why a consistent edge platform can be very important if you're you're architecting these new new decisions and seeing where where Red Hat can help get you, um, you know, because with this new hybrid cloud that is out there, you may not have a single place or a single type of way to push all this out. You know, you're probably going to have resource constrained systems if you're dealing with edge like IoT gateways. I mean, this could even be like smart smart displays, vehicles. You know, you'll have those at the edge that you need to push stuff out. But then you'll have your own infrastructure, maybe in a, a public or private cloud. Um, or your own bare metal still that needs to, you know, closer to your data center, just because it's not on the very far edge, it still is, you know, integral to supporting your edge locations. Um, and having this um, platform to go across all of these can be very beneficial. I mean, really, with all these use cases we've been discovering um, and looking out to get, uh, it's it's really fun to see what some of our customers are doing and then um, see where we can go go next to get to some of these use cases. But really, like I said, with all these diverse use cases, we're still only really scratching the surface of what's out there. Um, so we'd really like to, um, you know. Yeah, so, so true, so true. We know so many of you are, are already operating on the edge. We would love to hear from you. Um, we would you know, love to hear your edge stories and use cases. What are you doing in the edge space? So please share. Um, you can always contact uh, um, through your, your Red Hat account representative um, here what's in store and, and to share uh, any use cases and um, feedback that you would like to share. So with that, um, Brian and I thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, don't forget to check us out on some of the social media sites you see here on the YouTube uh, link. I will point out some great videos uh, available there. And we hope that you enjoy the rest of your time exploring sessions at Ansible Fest. So thanks everyone. Happy automating.